Good morning, ladies, and welcome to the Women to Women National Conversations Tour. Our presentation, Let's Talk About It. Uh, we're going to do a couple of housekeeping issues before we bring in our panelists and our president. This is an audio only discussion, but if you have questions that you'd like to submit, please feel free throughout the conversation to submit them in the chat box and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, after the presentation, the it is recorded and we will have it on our website, which is w the number two wtour.com, as well as all of our social media platforms. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah Chamberlain, president and founder of the Women to Women's National Conversations Tour. Sarah. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Cecilia, for putting all of this together. Could not do this without the two of you. And ladies, thank you for joining us this morning. Our nation has been rocked by tragedy and unrest in recent weeks and months, shaking the very tipping point of the global pandemic and widespread economic uh, devastation, of course, the racial injustice that is happening. We are encouraged that our country will return to a sense of normalcy soon. But just a little bit about the Women to Women National Conversations Tour. We travel the country, Sharon and Cesario go with me, and we engage women in candid and frank conversations about issues that are important to, to all of us. We've had the pleasure of meeting many of you in person, and hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to get on tour again and meet the rest of you that we haven't had the opportunity to. Fingers crossed on that. But in the meantime, it is extremely important to keep this conversation going. The virus has caused us not to meet with you in person, but to be able to do it here on Zoom and whatever platform we use. And our message is always, you tell us, we tell Washington. We've had some amazing um, calls here recently, but today we have two great women joining us and talking about issues that are important to small businesses. So I could introduce them, but I'm actually not going to because their resumes are amazing and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So first is our very dear old friend, not in age, but in relationship time, is uh, Corinne and then followed up by our new friend, Jane. So Corinne, let's start with you. Thank you, Sarah. It's such a pleasure to be here and, um, and to be with all of the audience participants today. I'm Corinne Hodges. I'm the CEO of the Association of Women's Business Centers. I joined in January of last year, 2019. Just got my feet uh, really firmly planted on the ground. And of course, this pandemic struck all of us um, early this year. Uh, the network of women's business centers, though, have been our first responders. We have 150 locations of women's business centers. We're in almost every single state. Uh, with the exception of Mississippi and Alaska, and our hope is that we'll have some women's business centers coming online this year in those states to, uh, to meet those needs. But women's business centers have been sort of economic first responders, um, in addition to the other SBA resource partners, as well as, of course, SBA themselves. Uh, the women's business centers have seen such a surge of demand this year, especially in light of the pandemic, some of them serving two times to 10 times the amount of, of regular demand. So in light of that, the, that network and the services they provide, I look forward to, uh, to discussing more about what small businesses can do now that the stimulus package is out. Thank you, Corinne. Hi. Jane, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody, thank you. Um, I am uh, a longtime district director at the SBA. I've had a couple careers before SBA, but I've been um, the district director in Iowa for the last five years. And previously, um, I was uh, the director in West Virginia, Delaware, Virginia, and a regional advocate um, with the Office of Advocacy. So I am uh, very active in a lot of women's business issues. and. Um, I have been all of my career, but um, a big advocate. So um, let it turn over. It's more important for us to get to the question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jane. 
Um, Corinne, you represent thousands of female business owners and future entrepreneurs. What are you hearing about PP and EIDL? Well, we, we do serve really typically in a year 150,000 women businesses, and, um, and this year we expect that number to be much greater. We hear successes, and we also hear about some of those frustrations too. Um, we hear, you know, with the changing guidance on the forgiveness aspect, that to me is a positive. It's been a positive move in the right direction as we're able to um, really empower some of the small, smaller lenders, CDFIs, et cetera, to be able to provide those PPP loans. We see that that is truly um, the best service option in terms of small businesses that our women's business centers serve. Typically, these women that we serve, um, they're, they're categorized as economically and socially disadvantaged. They don't typically have a relationship with one of the larger banks. And so having access to some of these smaller locations is certainly ideal. Um, we, we're working with women's business centers to continue to equip them to stay always um, knowledgeable about the changing guidelines so that they can respond to the questions that seem to continue to come from small businesses. What do I need to do to get this forgiven? And exactly how can I calculate what will be forgiven so that I can go about spending the money? There's certainly been um, a, a great deal of women's businesses that have received the PPP funding and then were hesitant to spend the funds because they weren't sure that it would all be forgiven and they were really reticent to take on more more loans. You know, that, that's actually a key part of PPP. I've had some friends who have small businesses, they're hesitant to take uh, take it on as well because they're afraid that, that as things keep changing, they're going to have to pay it back. Um, so that's a good point. you made other programs that may be um, available for small business owners outside of PPP in EIDL. Sarah, um, was that question directed to me? It cut my audio cut out just a little bit. Yes. Jane. Okay. Yeah, Jane. Are, are you asking me, uh, Jane? Yes, Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. It was cutting out. Um, actually, too, um, okay. there were some changes overnight that came out on the um, some of the ad additional changes to forgiveness. I think there's definitely a lot more positive changes that are going on. We are personally um, advising a lot of small businesses that we work with to hold off on applying for forgiveness until um, the, the, all the final rules come out. But definitely, um, I, I think you know, you look at some of at some of the industries, particularly restaurants with the government shutdown um, orders and everything that the eight week period was very, very difficult for many of them. And I think now that um, it's being extended out to 24, um, 24 weeks and some of the different things that are uh, very favorable that we're going to see um, a rush here at the very end. The program is ending um, June 30th. There's not going to be any extension beyond that, and there's still a, a, almost 130 million dollars left in the pro, 130 billion, excuse me, um, left to to be lended out. So um, I I think if if you have some people that have been sitting back, I would really encourage them to get into um, really get out there and and uh, and especially because there are some lenders that are shutting down and aren't doing anymore. So there's going to be less lenders that are more act or that are, are aren't as active in um, in the PPP program right now. So with just a couple of weeks left in the program, they might be um, spending um, some time trying to find a lender. So don't wait till the last second. Um, just really encourage everybody to get out. And if you're not sure, um, you're still trying to find a lender, contact your local SBA district office and they'll help you. They have lists of the banks that are participating and um, we'll be able to help you to navigate that as well. There are other programs, you know, from the SBA end, um, we have done a lot beyond just PPP and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan 
program, we have um, we're making six months of payments on existing SBA loans to help small businesses with the cash flow. Any new loans that are being made currently um, during the the pandemic, we're also paying six months of making six months of payments on those loans. And anybody who has an existing SBA disaster loan, they are being deferred through to the end of the of 2020. So there's a lot of activity um, happening, and we've seen also too one of the changes that has been made is our SBA Express line of credit program or the, the working capital has been um, expanded beyond 350,000 up to 1 million um, to help small businesses. So I, I think there will be some more things coming down um, coming down the line as we get through some different phases of the recovery. Thank you very much. Corinne, one of our participants submitted a question. She's been recently laid off and she's now motivated to start her dream business. Where does she start? Does she, I have a plan for capital, but I need some guidance. That is the story of so many women that come to women's business centers. Um, in fact, I can share with you an example of a women's business who, who pivoted, but who came to a women's business center only with an idea. Um, and this business, she, she's in Chicago. She's a woman of color who had never um, owned her own business. She had a little bit of money in her pocket, but she, more than anything, she had an idea and she had a, she definitely had a dream. The idea that she had was to help daycare businesses provide an additional revenue stream by building a, a technology platform that would allow the daycare business to schedule uh, pickup of the children as well as drop-offs um, by providing that extra service, she could bring additional revenue into her business and everything was really going gangbusters. She'd come into the Women's Business Center in Chicago back in 2016 and her business had really taken off. In fact, uh, I think it was in January and she was on the brink of signing a million dollar contract. She had 64 some uh, daycare businesses all um, as customers and, and so revenue was flowing in. and as you all know, COVID hit and the daycare industry basically shut down. She, she working with her women's business center, um, basically said, I, I have to save my business. I know that I need to restore customer pipelines, so what do I do? She repurposed her business using the exact same technology platform to, be, to enable restaurants and retail to schedule curbside pickup and delivery. And so she changed the name of her business from Go Nanny to Go Logic. She's now helping businesses in the Chicago area and beyond pivot their businesses to be successful. Um, so, I mean, that's really a long way to tell you, go to a women's business center, they'll help you develop the idea, they'll help get you um, capital ready, um, and even perhaps suggest, suggest to you lenders along the way that can help you. So Corinne, that is a great example. God, she's amazing. That's a great idea to change and do that. So Jane, uh, one guest asked, she recently was on the SBA site and became overwhelmed with information. Are there counselors or advisors available to help her navigate the site? Absolutely, Corinne was just talking about um, our Women's Business Center program. We have four um, uh, SBA resource partners in our network. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of the Women's Business Centers and every all the things that they do. Um, we work very, very closely with them here in our district office and all around the country. We also have small business development centers, school chapters, and veterans business outreach centers. So all of them can provide um, counseling and training. But um, just as far as navigating the website, we get a, a, a mixture of feedback on that. Usually we get a, um, a lot of positive feedback that about all the information that's on there, but they can always contact their, their local district office. We have 68 offices around the country. They can help them to identify where on the website there is information, but 
certainly there's a whole section on on where you'll find information on the Women's Business Center and all of the programs related to women business owners. And also there's um, a terrific online training center on there as well. Contact your local. I, I, I mean, I, I always tell everybody in, in our market, just pick up the phone and call the local district office if you have any questions on anything. Just know that you're not in this alone and there's a lot of resources out there. Thank you, and Jane. Another guest kind of asked, can you apply for more than one SBA program? Oh, absolutely. Um, most small businesses have multiple um, SBA loans. Um, I've known businesses to be in the 8A program for government contracting, to have different um, multiple loans, could have disaster loan and um, term loans and working capital or line of credit, a little bit of everything. You can also work with all of our resource partners across the board. Um, you're not married to one. You could be working and getting counseling from the Women's Business Center and attending a SCORE workshop. Um, you know, we all work together and all these resources are available. But it is it is very common for businesses to have um, be tapping into all of these programs and and um, not only the the counseling and training resources, but also the financing um, programs across the board. There's just a maximum Thank that you, we can have exposure on on loans, but um, it's it's very common for businesses to have multiple loans. Thank you. Corinne, we know you we you recently partnered with SBDC to launch a resource guide. Can you tell us a little bit about this effort? Yeah, definitely. Um, just like um, Jane mentioned, the SBDCs are one of the SBA resource partners. And so America's SBDC, which is their association, and then us, the Association for the Women's Business Centers, we were both named in the CARES Act um, because Congress wanted to see a one website stood up that would really collect um, and, and convene all of the federal agency information for small business related to COVID in one place. So we created that website. Uh, the address is covid-sb, like smallbusiness.org. Um, it's a well-funded project. It is in its early stage. It's, I think we would call this the beta stage. We have a couple of pretty cool features in there, like a a chat bot you can interact with, but um, but soon we'll actually have live customer service agents there that can respond to questions. Um, but to get to a live person, the best way is to click the local assistance option. And local assistance is offered all over the website, top right-hand corner, but everywhere. And there you can search any of the four resource partners in your area, in your state. You can slice and dice and kind of search any way you like. Um, but the great thing is it gives you the option to email them, you can call them, you can see where they're located and see what's most convenient. Um, so the idea is that the resource partners give you the, they break it down human to human, right? They can give you the real down and dirty on what not only are is available from the federal agencies, how does it apply to you and your business? What do you need to do given your own individual circumstances? Because two of the same kind of business even in the same community might be in very different business stages and have very, very different needs. And that's where the technical assistance can help. And that's why Congress wanted to be sure we stood up this website. Great, thank you, Corinne. So Jane, SBA is known for the voice of a small business community. Do you think in the wake of the pandemic, more programs will become available to assist in the small business community? Absolutely. I think that there's a, a different stages of the recovery, and right now we're in the early stages of the recovery, and we'll, we will see, you know, as um, Congress is evaluating and, and, and Treasury and the SBA and other resources, other federal agencies out there, just really determining uh, what has been successful, where there still are gaps. Um, it, you know, certainly we're seeing some gaps in in the PPP program, and there's some concern about underserved markets and and uh, accessing and and applying for the programs and 
and really have in many cases because uh, lacking that banking relationship. And so that's where some of the fintech has come in and the um, options as well as the um, treasury programs like CDFIs that um, Corinne had mentioned. So I think there's going to be a lot of things opening up. And I think, um, you know, just moving forward, especially with some of the unrest that we're seeing right now, I think there's going to be a lot of effort with some supplier diversity programs and that are going to benefit women and particularly women of color businesses that we're going to see moving forward. And if I was a corporation today and I didn't have a supplier diversity program, I would really recommend that you get your act together and start really looking at what you're doing for um, your, your purchasing from women-owned businesses and um, other underserved markets and women of color businesses. So Jane, I completely agree with you. So Corinne, this kind of leads in the next question. Are there programs designed especially for women of color? Well, uh, across the Women's Business Center program, our focus has always been women businesses. Um, we, we recognize the diversity of women businesses. We certainly see it, we can certainly track it. And in fact, across the Women's Business Center network, whether you're in California or here on the East Coast, um, you can find biz you can find services in as many as 38 different languages. And so we do we offer services to the community based on what the local needs are. But I wouldn't say that any of the programs are specific necessarily for women of color. They're intended to lift up all women, including women of color. And we're certainly excited, you know, about what we've seen in the success of, of women of color um, in the entrepreneurship space. We've seen more women of color open new businesses than any other demographic category. Um, where I think the greatest challenges have certainly been, have been in access to capital. And so we are working with all segments of the Women's Business Center client base to be sure that they're all empowered so that they can access capital. And where we've seen, you know, the place to start there is typically with financial literacy. And, then, and again, that applies across the board with all of the clients that we serve. Financial literacy is just something that, quite frankly, women still have not really mastered. And so we need to help each other and we need to focus on financial liter literacy ourselves. But um, prioritizing women of color is, is consistent with our values. Um, to the extent that we are also partnering with HBCUs in the communities where they exist. So there are 101 HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and our women's business centers are partnering with them to be sure that the outreach is happening, to be sure that entrepreneurship classes are happening. But more than more than not, you know, they're they're building programs to suit that student or recent graduate. Um, but not necessarily exclusively focused on women of color. Great. Thank you. So, Jane, one of our guests asked, I'm a recipient of the SBA 8A program and have since graduated. Can I reapply? But, Jane, also, could you explain what the 8A program is for our audience? Absolutely. So the 8A program is a nine-year business development program that helps um, small businesses by um, building their capacity to compete in federal contracting. It's it's not just um, about um, it, it's kind of looking at it um, from a very broad perspective to provide a lot of training to to help position that business owner to be able to compete more effectively on contracts. As you know, and, and we've all been, um, that was a long, long fight for many years for um, advocates for women business owners, especially to raise that goal for government contracting. But um, the, the program targets socially and economically disadvantaged businesses, but it's a nine year program and there's a lot of business development training along the way, but there are, government set aside for um, businesses to compete for those contracts. So the, by statute, the program is designated as um, the, the small business owner has 
nine years of eligibility to be able to participate in that program. Once somebody has been through the program and has graduated, they are not eligible to come back into the program because if you've used your nine years of eligibility, um, then, uh, then they're not eligible again. But um, certainly, uh, we, um, we work very closely. We're doing a lot on, you know, a lot of 8A graduates, too, um, have gotten, looked at some of the um, getting into some other certifications, whether it's um, a hub zone or historically underutilized business zone uh, certifications or if they're service-disabled veteran-owned business. But it's certainly in the next few months, we're, uh, as we're rolling out at the SBA, expanded certification for women-owned businesses um, through some different um, private sector um, certifiers. Um, there will be more of a focus on that, too, at the federal level. But um, they will not be, 8A graduates are not able to come back into the program after they've used their nine years of eligibility. Thank you, Jane. So, Corinne, uh, SBC is an advocate for uh, women-owned businesses. Here at Women to Women, we like to encourage our participants. So, can you share, other than the one you already shared with Chicago, which is an amazing story, can you share a couple other success stories during that have happened during this pandemic crisis? Yeah, sure. I actually pulled I pulled a couple of stories, um, so I would have some handy here. I've got one. Um, uh, really from my state of Maryland in Berlin, Donna Kumpfer. She's the co-owner of Sisters Wine Bar. And she said that the PPP loan application guidance that she got from the Maryland Women's Business Center, um, we have three women's business centers here. This one is called Maryland Capital Enterprises. They're in Salisbury. But she said that um, the Salisbury Women's Business Center helped her at a time when everything was just crazy. She said, no one around me knew what was going on, but Maryland Capital Enterprise helped me a lot through that. She says, they helped me with a lot of the processing. Um, so through the Bank of Ocean City, you have to go through a bank, but they helped me with every step of that. She says, just knowing what I'm supposed to do and how to fill out the application meant everything. And then here's one, um, Janae Gutierrez, owner of Madre Churros and Cacao, she worked with the San Diego Women's Business Center to establish her company. And later she came back and relied on the networking community that she built working with the Women's Business Center. She relied on that network for support as she adapted her business practices to create the drive-through and the pickup system, um, which was obviously a, a pivoting strategy for the business from COVID. Um, uh, here's one, a, a retail shop and clothing line. Jenny Lenick, owner of Jenny Lemons, is a small batch retail shop. She reached out to the Renaissance Women's Business Center, which is up in the northern part of California in the Bay Area when COVID hit. And she was connected with a resiliency coach who helped her create a plan, diversify her products by using fabric scraps from her shop to host for a free online class on making fabric protective masks for COVID. Um, so we have a lot more stories like that um, out there, but I think that gives you a good, a good sample. Okay, Corinne, those are great stories. So thank you for sharing those with us. It just shows women can do anything. So Jane, <laughs> sometimes um, disadvantaged businesses are kind of all grouped together. They're lumped together. And do you think, in wake of all the social crisis in this country, that we should see programs designed specifically for each disadvantaged group? Well, at the SBA, you know, legally we can't have um, individually or individual loan programs and things like that um, for targeted groups, but we do a lot of targeted outreach and um, for individual groups, whether, you know, on, you know, with Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, um, um, working with mayors um, in urban areas, you know, right now we've been here in Iowa, um, we don't have as many resources as maybe as some of the states I've worked with in, in, on, in the Mid-Atlantic region, 
but um, we've been very concerned, our district office, on the really making sure that the PPP lending was getting out to um, particularly Black-owned businesses. And so we've been working very closely with um, a mayor that we have a very close relationship with and um, uh, doing workshops and, and uh, webinars and different things and, and just personally following up individually with businesses. So there, there is a lot of targeted outreach um, as far as initiatives and programming, but uh, you know, as far as SBA actual loan programs, um, you're, that you're not able to, um, we're not able to have specific loan programs. But we're certainly doing things on um, with tribal nations, and um, you know, with. Uh, we have a big um, here in Iowa. We have a big immigrant entrepreneurship summit that kind of covers um, a, a, a lot of different um, ethnicities um, with fairly new immigrants coming in, and we've had a lot of success with that. But um, but then we will individually go out and and work with um, different immigrant communities and um, populations, and through whatever you know with um, different uh, targeted groups too, there might be different resources that um, um, that we have. But I, I want to say, Corinne, I, from my experience too, our Women's Business Center here has done um, probably the best work as far as the, uh, you know, outreach in um, working with underserved markets with um, women of color businesses and I'm just very proud of of their their commitment and um, the success that they've had here um, here in in Iowa. Thank you, Jane. So, Corinne is a national representative for small business centers. Are there any geographic trends that you're seeing as women are opening or starting businesses? Well, we are seeing trends, but, um, you know, it's really directly related to the COVID stuff recently, you know, in the, in the rural areas and where maybe social distancing regulations or requirements haven't been quite as strict, some of the smaller businesses are faring better or, um, or, have, or have been able to start up, you know, a little bit more freely. And then in areas where the restrictions have been so much more tougher, or the reopening process has been slower, it's it's really required more innovation of the businesses. And those who've been able to innovate have truthfully been the most successful. Um, I think there are some exceptions to that. There are probably, well, not probably, there are definitely some industries that just really can't pivot well. Um, you know, and I think about, I mentioned daycare a little a little while ago. It seems as if all across the country, that industry has has not only just been hit hard, but is relatively stood still. And we know that women um, in particular are stronger in the retail sectors in terms of the businesses that they're starting, or I should say service sector. And the service sector has been the hardest hit sector. So across the board, coast to coast, women, I, I've, I've seen the reports, women are the hardest hit demographic in terms of COVID, regardless of region. So we see some geographical trends, maybe on the micro perspective, but from a macro, we, women really need the most support, it seems like, um, to be able to start a business, to restart their business, or just to reestablish that customer pipeline. Thank you, Corinne. And Jane, what is happening in Iowa with the women-owned businesses? Same. Well, one of the reasons I picked Iowa a few years ago to come here is at the time, five years ago, we were um, in many um, polls, we were ranked 51st in the country for women-owned businesses. And there was a group of women that um, a lot of different organizations and a lot of leadership in our state that really took that seriously, that um, really were front and center. We have a woman governor who has been a very strong advocate for women business owners. Um, we also have a very strong NABO chapter here, National Association of Women Business Owners, 
And to be honest, that's part of the reason I came here because it's my, um, I, I have a very strong advocate, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm a strong supporter of women owned businesses. And um, we've really seen a lot of things grow. We're up in the, in the low 30s now as far as our rankings for women-owned businesses. We have one of the largest or the fastest-growing NABO chapters in the country, very, very active here. And definitely the, there's a lot of activity for women business owners, and it has really propelled in the, the last um, few years in particular. So um, I think there's a lot of excitement right now. Um, uh, for women-owned businesses, and we're starting to see more and more activity. I think there's still some challenges in some of the rural areas where we don't have as um, as many resources, if you will, um, and trying to engage, um, to, uh, you know, across the state. But um, but definitely, we're seeing a lot of activity. I've been writing a lot of success stories. Um, I think I've done 18 so far on PPP recipients, and um, most of, a lot of them have been women business owners. And so I've been really, uh, my ears on the ground, or uh, I have my ear to the ground, really listening to a lot of the issues facing women-owned businesses. And it's been, um, I think that they're really coming out of this with working together and um, and supporting each other. And I think that that's that's a key because I think that women business owners in particular tend to support each other and um, and purchase from each other's businesses. And it, it, they're really taking it to heart that we're all in this together and trying to help each other out. So a lot of um, positive um, uh, things going on in Iowa, despite the current challenges um, to the economy with the COVID. But I, I think that um, because of that that strong foundation, we'll come out of this even stronger. Thank you, Jane. I'll tell you, I was lucky to have you there helping them. So, ladies, we could go on and on and on for hours, but as we've been talking, we've been getting some additional questions. So I'm actually going to hand it over to Cecilia, and she will start asking them. Cecilia? Hello. Uh, yes. Our first question is, what are women's business centers doing to assist businesses with reopening strategies? Thanks, Cecilia. So women's business centers, all, all of them offer counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling. All of them offer training programs. They're, any given women's business center is offering multiple training sessions that you could choose from. Um, and then they're offering networking opportunities, albeit virtual, you know, at, at the present time, as well as mentorship opportunities, which would probably also be virtual, most likely. Um, but given that you can go to a women's business center and get free one-on-one -on -one counseling, it should always be a first stop. It's the women's business center is is kind of the center of the the hub of the wheel, and they're connected to all of the other resources in the local community and can very help, you know, very quickly help that business identify exactly what else they might need. Um, some of the training programs are offered um, for low cost, and some of these are very resource intensive, where the business owner is going to walk away with something very tangible and something very valuable, whether it's that business plan or it's a new uh, financial forecast or, um, or, or a, a strategic pivoting plan. Um, but some of them will charge for some of the training, um, but, but you can definitely go in there and know you're getting free resources because they are a government subsidized program. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have an attendee asking, I own a small restaurant and receive PPP for my business and now find we can't reopen at all because we are too far in debt and cannot make a profit. What do I need to do for the next steps? Okay, I would recommend, um, we met, we've been mentioning, um, uh, Corinne uh, certainly has been talking about the Women's Business Center. Please remember that you have four resource partners affiliated with the SBA that are critical for counseling and training, and um, don't forget that you have them. But as our, what state, I, I'm not sure what state the person is, but I, I know if we're all in different variations of opening back up right now. They are extending out 
the um, the forgiveness period, but that I know that the eight weeks um, was really um, the clock was ticking for a lot of small businesses, and then particularly if they got the funding and they've been using it, um, there's another issue out there that um, people are really needing the capital right now to get beyond um, into the next phase. I um, I just really recommend, uh, I've been working with a lot of um, restaurants that have been very creative in, in their marketing and they're getting their online presence and, and um, you know, working with different organizations. So um, a lot of our I don't know if there's different organizations, whether they're involved with the Chamber of Commerce or with the Restaurant Association, but I know a lot of um, local um, entities have been really trying to help the restaurants by promoting them. And, um, people, you know, we are constantly going out and going to these websites and identifying um, places that we can go to or that it's doing takeout or, or delivery and everything. So there, take advantage of all the resources. As far as the funding, um, there have been some questions, and I know in the um, Senate Small Business Committee yesterday, there was some discussion about this, about what is the next phase? It, it, will there be another phase of the PPP? And, you know, the, the eight weeks, 24 weeks, that there's, a, again, a capital gap for, uh, particularly in the restaurant industry. So I think if there is any movement for another round, we're going to see um, some targeted industries. And whether that's going to be restaurants or not, I'm not sure. Um, we have a, a $130 billion left, as I mentioned, that's kind of been staying there for a little bit for the last couple of weeks with nobody tapping into it. And so with the program ending on June 30th, um, I don't know. I, I kind of, from the discussion yesterday, it seemed like there was some open discussion about what do we do? Do we open that back up to um, to get some additional funding out there to everybody, um, the particular industries? So um, there there might be some changes down the road with that. But I would continue to be um, the advocate. I think that the the restaurant industry has been very outspoken and about what their needs are. And I would add, just con continue to make sure that your local representatives know what's going on with your business. Um, that's absolutely critical. I know that doesn't help you, your particular business right now, um, but, but also contact your local SBA district office. Get connected into some of the local resources if you don't know where to turn or what might be the best resource for you locally. So well, thank you, ladies. This really, we could do this all day, um, but unfortunately we have to wrap up so we won't get to all the questions. But I have one question to kind of end this, and Corinne, I'll start with you and then Jane. So what words of encouragement would you offer to women-owned businesses that are trying to rebuild or to start over? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I think if the story that I mentioned to you about the business owner in Chicago is is at all um, indicative of what what's possible when we set our minds to something, I really think that's what's important. I mean, women have been successful over these last several decades, really because they've set their mind to it. And that means I think any of us can be successful if we set our mind to it, if we attach ourselves to the right resources. And we don't necessarily get bogged down in the fear of what we can't control, but instead open our minds and our hearts up to the up to the, the spirit of what's possible. And so I would encourage you to do that and find a network of supporters, whether it's women's business centers or small business development centers or whatever, um, that are like-minded with that and will support you and get you to your goal. Um, we know we're in tough times, and we will get through this together. I, I think you. it's um, just as somebody who is a, a strong advocate for women business owners, and I'm very proud that I work for an, a, a federal agency that has small business in its name, and um, because we're we're very proud. I, I mean, our workforce at the SBA is very very committed because of 
Um, we know that we work for small businesses, but this has been very personal for a lot of us um, that are on the front lines trying to to help because these business owners are our friends, our family, our, our neighbors, um, and we're all in this together. And just what Corinne was saying, that is so true. But I think if anything positive comes out of this entire mess, it's that America has finally woken up to how important small business is. And, and that was a huge wake-up call because when, when they can't access some of these resources and they realize, geez, they, they just took, us for, took small businesses for, um, for granted, I think now we're not going to see that and there's going to be more advocacy. But I, I've also seen a lot of um, closing of the ranks, if you will, with the support because a lot of um, – I, I spend every Saturday out there with signs that we use for national – or for, um, um, I'm sorry, Small Business Saturday, that we wave signs on busy um, intersections encouraging people to shop mom and pop and be loyal by, by local and, and honk for small business and that type of thing. And, um, you know, I've, I've really seen a lot of the women business owners step up with that. And, you know, we're, we're all, um, by nature, I think just everybody's really supporting each other. But know that you're not in this alone. And I mean that very seriously, because I know from our perspective, what our team has gone through in our office. And I am so proud of our team, because they have, uh, they just have been working ridiculous hours because of the commitment that they have. And I know that's all across the country with the SBA field offices. So um, anyhow, we just know that I think that you're more appreciated today than maybe you even were two months ago. And we're all gonna come out of this and we're gonna be much stronger because you are the heroes of the American economy and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You know, thank you so much for that message. Corinne and Jane, this has been a great conversation. I thank you so much for joining us. Everybody listening, we thank you for joining us as well. Remember to please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and stay tuned for our next webinar. Remember, you tell us, we tell Washington. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.